Well, good morning. morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is uh, the Reformation. This is in our um, category classes we call Family Tree. It's all about the church. So that's um, church history. That's uh, the class that Paul's doing right now on building community. That's a church class. It all fits within this same category of life in the church and uh, learning about the church. So this is a follow-up. If you... um, Maybe we're in our class, or maybe you watched it online, the family tree, the early church fathers. We sort of covered the time from the resurrection of Jesus up until the Reformation uh, during that class. And so now we're going to try to cover the Reformation. Now, I'll say on the front end, uh, six weeks to try to cover cover the Reformation is not enough time. Uh, So what we're going to hopefully do is to give you the main contours. I'm not a Reformation scholar. Uh, I'm a pastor. Uh, So I'm I'm not going to be able to answer every question um, what I hope to do is to be fair to all sides, uh, to be fair um, to, uh, to the Roman Catholic Church. I want to represent their views well and explain well why we had the Reformation. Um, but I'm not going to be able to answer every question. I'm not a, a scholar when it comes to the Reformation. In six weeks, it's not enough for us to delve into all of the things that we could, could be said about the Reformation. But hopefully, you will see the broad contours of, of the Reformation and just sort of give you a, a heads up of where we're going. Uh, this week, we're going to do all background to talk about why, need, why, was, why was the Reformation needed, what was uh, going on at the time, what was going on in the life of the church, uh, what are the, the sort of things that set up this Reformation that was going um, to happen. Uh, it's sort of, if you think about what we're going to talk about today, sort of like a fire, right? What are, what are the logs that were TP'd? What was the, uh, the brush that was put under those? And what was the spark that sort of lit, lit the Reformation? We're going to talk about all that today. Uh, next week, we'll talk about Luther. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll talk about Zwingli and the, the Reformation in Switzerland. Uh, and then talk about Calvin. Uh, and then the last week, uh, we'll talk about the English Reformation, or the fifth week, rather, uh, the, the, the English Reformation. And then the last week, we'll talk about um, a little bit of the, the Puritans, but mainly try to tie all of these pieces back together and talk about why does it matter? Why, why should we spend six weeks talking about the Reformation? What, what impact does that have on us? Uh, today, I'll tell you at the beginning two uh, two resources if you're interested and want to know more and, and uh, I'm going to scoot this over and read more about the Reformation. Uh, this first one is a little book by Michael Reeves called The Unquenchable Flame. Uh, it's a really short read. Uh, this I've used this book heavily in this uh, in preparing for this class as well as some others. But this is a if you if you're not familiar with the Reformation at all and you say I, I would like to pick up something and read it. This would be a great book to pick up and read. It's not going to take you long. He's going to give you uh, the the pattern that we're following of setup. Uh, Luther, uh, Zwingli, Calvin, uh, uh, English Reformation, and Puritans. That's how he. That's how he lays out his book. Uh, and then, if you want a little bit of a longer read, maybe one of the um, the best church historians that's currently living is a man named Timothy George. Uh, he wrote this this book called Theology of the Reformers. It's a little longer. It's a little thicker. Uh, if you really want to dig in uh, to the theology of the Reformation, the theology particularly of the Reformers, and to look at those things, so I would recommend uh, both of those resources um, to you. But let me pray, and then we'll uh, we'll begin. To, to dig in. Father God, we, we love you and we thank you for the grace that you have given us in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for um, all the mercy that, that we don't deserve, but that is freely given to us, uh, new mercies for us each and every day. We thank you for the Reformation. We thank you for these men that we're going to talk about today, uh, that though they were uh, imperfect and flawed men, that you used them uh, to recover the gospel. And so, Father, we, uh, we pray that you would help us to have uh, clear minds, uh, eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would be reminded not just of history, but that we would be reminded of what is ours in Christ and the, the grace and mercy that has come to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I want you to, to picture for, uh, for just a minute. It is Wednesday, April 16th, 1521. And Martin Luther is being uh, pulled into the city gates uh, at a place called Worms, Germany. It looks like Worms, uh, Worms, Germany. He's pulling in thousands of people are on the sides of the street. They're cheering. Trumpets are blowing. Um, it would seem like a party, but Luther is actually coming to be tried. Uh, and if he's found guilty of heresy, he's going to be put to death. And so thousands of people have come to see the spectacle. So Luther is, is there on April, uh, that, that April night, uh, put in his room. The next day, the imperial, the imperial herald comes to get him, but the streets are so full, um, they can't take him out the front way. They have to sneak him out the back. And people see him snuck out of the back, and they begin to climb on roofs to watch him uh, as he's taken by the imperial guards to the hall. Uh, he gets to the hall. It's about 4 o'clock. Uh, the hall is packed with people, and they stand him before Charles V, who is, at the time, the Holy Roman Emperor. is also the Lord of Spain, Austria, Burgundy, southern and northern Italy, the Netherlands, 
and he was considered God's viceroy on earth. So you here have essentially the leader of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, staunch defender of the church, uh, and standing before him is Luther in his monk garbs, uh, and uh, he, when they bring him in, they, they say that Charles V muttered, he will not make a heretic out of me. And they command him not to speak until he's spoken to. And then the spokesman for Charles V begins to lay out the case against Luther. He, he shows this table that has all of these books that Luther has written. And he says, I want you to first acknowledge that you've written these things, acknowledge that this is your theology, and then I want you to recant. Uh, and Luther very quietly asks for more time. And no one was expecting this. He, he asked to have a day to think about it. And so they relent. They let him have a day to think about it. They send him back to his home. They come and get him the next afternoon, this time a little later. It's 6 o'clock now. He's back in the hall. He is, by all accounts, sweating profusely. The hall is packed. They have lit, uh, lit torches to, to light the room up. It is burning up. Luther is sweating profusely. They go through the same routine again. They say, are these your books? We need you to confess that you wrote these books, and then we need you to recant the theology that is within them. And this time, instead of being uh, scared and, and timid, Luther speaks much more boldly. Everybody expected that, especially having asked for more time to think about it, that he would come back and then recant his theology. But this time he comes back and he says, if I were to recant, I would become more a tool of the devil than you think I am right now. And he says, if any of you can refute what I've said from the scriptures, if you can prove me wrong from the scriptures, I'll be the first person to recant my theology. I'll be the first person to burn my books. Uh, they're uninterested in having any sort of theological or scriptural debate with him. Uh, he, he sort of ends his time speaking to the emperor. He says this, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. And they take him away, and they take him back to his room. And as he leaves, the, the Charles the, the fifth. Uh, people are, are, are chanting to the pyre with him. They're wanting to, they're wanting to have him burned. And, and after this confrontation, Charles V has determined, he says that he's determined to, quote, stake the, on this cause my kingdoms and my authority, my friends, my body and blood, my life and my soul. The battle lines for the Reformation at this point are drawn. And so what I want to do this morning is to say, how, how do we get there? How do we get this point to this point where Martin Luther is on trial for his life because of the things that he's taught. What's happening in the life of the church, what's happening in Roman Catholic theology that makes this Reformation necessary. So if you, when you came in, I hope there are still some left. Did everybody get a booklet? Uh, there are some, I think I still see some. There are still some on the back. So if you, when you came in, if you got one, if you picked one up, or if not, you may, you may go grab one. Um, I'm not going to put a ton of information in there. My goal is to give you enough to follow along and enough to take some notes and to write some stuff down uh, if, you, if you'd like. So the first thing I want you to, to look at in there is that first category is the need for reform. So as we think about what's going on in the life of the church, why are these reformers coming up? Why was there needed a reformation, a changing, a transformation of the church? Why was the ref reformation needed? Where, where did that need come from? First big thing we have to talk about is the structure of the church. Who was the head of the Roman Catholic Church? The Pope. So for uh, Roman Catholic theology, especially the early church, Rome, the city, was considered the mother, right? Rome was the mother of the church. And who's the father of the church? Pope. Why, why do they call him Pope? What's Pope mean? Papa, right? It's, it's father. So the, the Roman Empire, the, the Rome itself, was the mother of the church. And the Papa, the, the Pope, was the, the father of the church. He stands at the head of the church uh, where in Roman Catholic theology, why, why do they establish the Pope as the head of the church? Where in the scriptures do they get that? So they would consider Peter to be the first Pope, so that the Pope sit on the chair of Peter. Right? So they would say Peter was established as the first Pope, and then subsequently the church can elect popes, can, can choose uh, a man to stand as Pope, to stand as the father of the church. One thing, this is not, this is not in, your, in your notebook, but one thing that's gonna, that we have to understand about uh, the difference between, even, even now, Protestant theology and, and Roman Catholic theology, uh, is the relationship between the Bible and the church. So that we would say, as, as Protestants, and we'll see this is because of the Reformation, that we would say that it's the Bible that has created the church. 
But it's the Holy Spirit through the Word of God that the, the church flows out of the truth of what has been revealed to us. Does that make sense? It's the Bible that creates us. The reason that any of us are saved, the reason that we're a church, is because of the Bible. The Roman Catholic theology is the opposite. That the Bible then comes out of the church. So that if the Bible creates the church, what's the sole authority for us? The Bible. If the church creates the Bible, what's the sole authority? What's the final authority? The church is. It's not just the scriptures, though the scriptures are important, that the church holds the final keys, and ultimately the pope, the papa, the head of the church, holds those final keys so that alongside of the Bible, tradition matters, right? Church councils matter. What the church decides, those things matter uh, as important sometimes over and against the scriptures, uh, especially because in, in Catholic theology, this is again not in your, in your notebooks, that they consider, they consider the Bible to be the seed of theology. What do you think that means, that they call the Bible the seed of theology? Yeah. Exactly. So if, if you've been in my classes before, you know I'm such a great artist. Right? So this is, that's a Bible. I'll label it. <laughs> so open, that's an open Bible. So they would say it's, that this is the seed by which then... The tree of theology can grow out of, right? <laughs> tree. <laughs> By which the tree of theology can grow out of. So that, therefore, uh, the theology of the church doesn't necessarily have to be found in the Bible. Does that make sense? Because this is just the seed. It can grow out of that. So we're going to see things that we're going to talk about today that become uh, uh, Catholic doctrine, which you have to believe, that aren't found in the scriptures, which we would say, that's weird, why, why would they believe that? Why, that's not even in the Bible. Why would they make that a, a, a mark of the church? It's because it doesn't have to be there, right? Because it's, this is the beginning, uh, because the church, or the Bible belongs to the church, not the other way around. So that the church has this seed, but they would say, by the Holy Spirit, that the, that the God is moving in us, he's leading us, he's leading us through the Pope, that the church now can determine theology, that we can make decisions uh, based on the seed that grows out of, uh, out of the Scripture. So it begins with uh, uh, the, the Pope. Uh, he's called the Vicar of Christ. He, he is the representation of Christ to the people. He is, in Roman Catholic theology, the channel through which uh, God's grace flows to his people. So how is the grace of God going to get to the people? It's going to be through the Pope. And the Pope's going to appoint bishops who's, who are going to appoint priests. And together, they're the clergy. And it's through the clergy, um, which I, I've got this on there, that, that what, what uh, I like this term, it's why I use it, that Michael Reeves in his book calls it the tap of grace. So that together, the Pope, the bishops, and the priests have control over the tap of grace, like a like a, a, a tap that you would have outside your house for your garden hose. Right? So that how is the grace of God going to be poured out on the people of God? Well, it's the clergy who have control of that. So how is it that the people of God are going to receive the grace of God through the clergy? Well, it comes uh, through the seven sacraments. But before that, let's talk, let's talk about, I think I give you implicit faith, faith first, right? I don't have one of those booklets in my, in my hands. It's not in there? Okay, well, good. Don't have to worry about it. Uh, I'm going to run out of room. If you were in the, the last church history class where you can go back and watch it, uh, we're coming out of, as the Reformation is about to start, what time period are we coming out of? So we're going to 15th, 16th century. Yeah, we're coming out of the Dark Ages. We're coming out, out of medieval times in which uh, the middle class basically disappears. You have a ruling wealthy class. You have uh, really, really poor peasants. Uh, writing, uh, art, uh, scholastics all struggle, uh, that most people are illiterate, that they can't read. So it's during this time, and if you were in that class, you, you saw, I think often for, with good motives and good intentions, the Catholic Church began to move away for the laity, for normal people. They began to move away from explicit faith and to move towards what they considered implicit faith. So more than people being active participants in their faith, believing theology, being able to read the Bible, being able to, be able to understand and articulate what it is the church teaches, that, that was not really what they were worried about. That would be explicit faith. That they move towards implicit faith. You come and we will dole out the grace to you. You don't need to read. You don't need to know. You don't need to understand. That you come and stand under the tap of grace 
and you'll receive it. That it, it is implicit. If you come and you'll, you'll sort of jump through the hoops of the church, you can receive this grace, and it's, it's through an, an implicit faith. So one of the ways that we see the, 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 the seven ways that the church pours out the, the grace uh, upon the people is the seven sacraments. First, you have baptism, which they would consider the first taste of God's grace. When, do you, when are you baptized? As an infant, right? You're baptized as an infant. Uh, confirmation would, would come uh, as you're entering into adulthood at 12, 13. And once you're confirmed as a member uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, and there you take your first Mass, which we're going to come back to, to Mass in just a minute. Uh, we're going to come back to penance in just a second as well. Uh, this this uh, um, uh, act of confession with a priest, uh, marriage, ordination, and last rites. So you can see here, nobody in the Catholic Church can do all seven sacraments. Why? Yeah, yeah. priests can't be married. You can't, you can't have the sacrament of, of ordination and the sacrament of marriage, but this is the way by which the grace of God is poured out on people. So uh, some Roman Catholic theologies, uh, the, theologians at the time have described these seven sacraments as the seven arteries of the body of Christ. So they would say this is the way that the blood flows, the way that the grace gets to the people is through these, uh, is through these seven arteries. Does that make sense so far? All right, let's, let's, talk, about, let's talk about the Mass and what, what the Roman Catholic theology believes about Mass. So for, uh, for a long time, uh, the world operated, or many people operated, uh, with the view of, of Aristotle. Does anybody remember, when, uh, maybe you think back to high school when you were like in a philosophy class, and Aristotle uh, um, talked about his uh, two distinctions between substance and accidents. This is important to understanding the way the Catholic Church understands Mass. So Aristotle uh, was a philosopher. He said things have both a substance and an, and an accident. So if you were to, to take a wooden chair, that the, the substance of that chair would be, this is going to sound weird, would be its, its chairness. Right? It's, it's a wood chair. It's, it, it is what it is. The accidents might be uh, the color, might be dust that's on the chair, might be certain things about the chair. So Aristotle said the accidents of a thing can change. It can be painted, it can be cleaned, other things can happen, the way it looks can be changed, but the chairness of it, it is what it is. The substance is there. So when it comes to, when, when you come to the, uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation within the Catholic Church, this understanding of the Mass, remember we're talking about an implicit faith, that the people are coming to receive the Mass, they're coming to receive the grace of God. And if you go into even most, most Catholic churches now, but especially uh, Catholic churches in the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, uh, what, if you come to a Catholic church, especially an old one, what stands at the center of that church? What is all of the architecture leading you to? The altar. Right? All of the architecture. Uh, Scott and I, when we were in, uh, in England, uh, we're in Catholic churches, right? All the architecture, the center of the church is leading you to the altar. Now, at Buck Run and, and most Protestant churches, what, what stands normally at the center of our buildings? The pulpit. In this building, if you were to, to go down on any point in the, in the perimeter and, and draw a line to the center of the church, you know what's at the center of our church? The pulpit, right? That everything in the church leads us to there. In the Catholic Church, especially in this time, everything is leading you to an altar. Now, what happens on altars? A sacrifice is made. So they have to say, well, how is it that the people of God are going to receive the grace of God? Well, they're going to receive it through the Lord's Supper. They're going to receive it through the Mass. And so they would say, well, this Mass is a daily re-sacrifice of Jesus, that he is sacrificed again, that as the people partake in the Mass, they have this new receiving of the grace of Jesus that deals with the current sins, uh, that they're going to go out, they're going to get dirty, they're going to get mucked up again, but they can come back and receive anew through the Mass this new grace of God. So then begins, well, how is it that Jesus is present in the Mass? This is still an argument that the Protestants and uh, Catholics still fight. How is it that the presence of Christ uh, is still in the Mass? We would say that, that he's there with us through the Spirit. Right? So they, they come up with this, this doctrine, which is, I'm not going to try to write it from memory because I'm a bad speller, transubstantiation. Right? So it's based on uh, this, 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 uh, uh, what, what Aristotle taught, the difference between substance and accident. So Aristotle said, the accidents can change, the substance does not. So the Catholic theology flips that and says, no, no, in the Mass, that when the priest blesses it, that the accidents remain the same, but the substance changes. So that the, the, this, so if you're, if you're thinking about the Mass, this would be the bread and the wine. It still looks like bread and wine. The accidents, what it looks like, still, it just still looks like bread and wine. That stays the same. 
And what, is it, what does, the, does the substance become? The body and blood, uh, the body and blood of Christ, right? So that the substance changes. So if you, uh, you even in Catholic Church now, uh, a few years ago, I was at an Anglican wedding who hold a very similar view of um, uh, of, of the the mass. And the, the priest, asked, after he had given communion to folks, I turned to the guy sitting in me. I was like, "Hey, watch this!" And he just the priest turns up the cup and he has to drink the rest of the cup. Why? You can't pour out, right? You can't pour out the blood of Jesus, right? They would say the substance of the thing has, has changed. Now, interestingly enough, uh, how often do you think the people, the regular people, were allowed to eat the bread? One time a year. One time a year were laity allowed to eat the bread. They were never allowed to drink from the cup. Lest some stupid peasant spill the blood of Jesus. They were never allowed to, eat, to drink from the cup. Only the priest could drink from the cup. So that they were saying, you receive the grace simply by when the priest lifts up the bread, he holds it up and he blesses it, and he says a phrase in Latin, hoc est corpus meum. Anybody know what that means? Any Latin scholars? This is my body. And when he holds it up and he says that phrase in Latin, that, that the substance then changes to the body and blood of Jesus. And being there and looking upon this lifted up uh, elements and hearing what the priest says then confers the grace of God to you. Now, interestingly enough, not only um, all the masses were conducted in Latin. Do you know how many people spoke Latin? Very few people spoke Latin. Uh, what we find is often even the priests didn't speak Latin. And they found it quicker to memorize all the things that they were supposed to say to go through the Mass rather than actually having to learn Latin. So, Latin, so they just memorized. So often, if you were to go into uh, a Catholic church in the mid-15th century and to go to a Mass, there's a possibility that nobody in the room knows what's happening. Nobody knows. Nobody understands Latin. Nobody understands exactly what's being said. Uh, so much so, anybody ever heard the phrase hocus pocus? Do you know that's just, this is where the phrase hocus pocus comes from? So the, the priest holds up the body and he says, hoc, et, hoc est corpus meum. Now, at some point, that gets jumbled, whether because people who don't know Latin don't know what they're hearing or because a priest who doesn't know Latin doesn't know what he's saying. Hoc est corpus becomes hocus pocus. Which, when do you say, when, what, what, in what connotation do we use hocus, po- hocus pocus? Magic, right? <laughs> the priest holds up the bread and says hocus pocus. <laughs> right? That's where the phrase comes from. It, that they didn't understand what was being said often, not just the laity. Almost never would the laity have understood Latin, but even the priest himself didn't know Latin. Uh, so the, the thing is, you're going to come, you're going to have the wrath of God appeased for you uh, through, this, through this mass, through transubstantiation, through this, this shifting, this changing of, uh, changing of the elements. Yes? They, they would do it regularly, and we'll talk about that in a, more in a minute. They would do it regularly. You were only allowed to eat of it once a year. So depending on where you were, um, well, in, in just a minute we'll talk about as, as, um, as indulgence come around and as penance comes into the Roman Catholic theology, uh, there were some places that, like now, did Mass every single day. Um, but you couldn't, most people weren't allowed to eat the bread. You could eat the bread one time a year. And I'm not sure, I don't know what day of the year that was. I don't know. Yeah. Now, now I believe you can. In Roman Catholic theology now, I think if you were to go to a Roman Catholic church and take Mass, most churches do Mass every day, and that, I believe you'd be allowed to take, you'd be allowed to take the, to both eat the bread and drink the wine, I, I believe, in, in current Catholic churches. Uh, you can do that. At this time, that's not the case. At this time, the gap between the priests and the laity is massive. And honestly, even for some priests, the gap between the priest and what they actually know or what they should know is really, really massive that they don't, they don't even understand what's going on. So does that, does that make sense? The way, the way they understand Mass? Again, it's a piece of this tap of grace. How are you, how are you going to receive the grace of God? You don't have to necessarily know anything. You just got to come. You got to look at the bread. Right? You got to come and participate. It's in the church. You got to be a part of the Mass to, under, to, to, to get the grace of God. Um, a big part of, uh, of Catholic understanding of justification, of how it is that we're made saved, is this understanding that God pours his love into us, that as, we, uh, as we're saved, that we, he keeps pouring his love into us, he keeps by the Spirit remaking us, that helps us sort of fill us up with merit, that, he, that we're not lovable, but God essentially, by pouring his love into us, gives us merit and makes us lovable. Um, it's an Augustinian, uh, originally an Augustinian sort of, a way to think about justification. Um, what happens, though, is the Catholic Church begins to try to say, well, h- how do we ever know, then, that we're lovable? Right? If, if I'm being 
poured in by the love of God? How do I know that I really merit the love and the salvation of God? So in 1215, uh, the fourth Lateran Council, one of the church councils, the church decides to require penance or require confession uh, for people within the church. How are you going to know whether or not uh, you, you have these good works that, that are meriting the love of God, that are meriting the grace? Of, how, how do you know? How do you know that you're improving? How do you know the Mass is having any difference on your life? Well, you need to go to confession. You need to go to a priest. And so the priest would ask you all sorts of questions. I'm sure they're a little different now, but he would ask you, uh, are the works that you've done to serve God, are they done to hide sins and impress others, or are they done to please God? He would ask you, have you muttered against God for weather, illness, poverty, or death of a child? Notice they're the, the range, right? Have you muttered against God for the weather all the way to the death of a child? So they would ask you all of these questions. You would go sit with the priest, and he would ask you these questions to help you to think about yourself, to think about your life, to see essentially what difference is this making? Am I, do I have any progress in my life? Now, for the people who took it seriously, what do you think this did for them? Burdened them. Right? So there, there are all sorts of stories of, of folks who basically had mental breakdowns. Um, because if, you, if any of us were to have to go sit with somebody and to recount our sins, to confess our sins, how long, how long should we make that meeting? Yeah, right? that, it's, that this is part of sanctification, that the more holy we are, the more we grow to look like Jesus, the more aware we are of our sin. Right? So that when you're a new Christian, you think yourself to be a great sinner. But you're a greater sinner even than you know. And the more you look like Jesus, the more your eyes are open to see all the things you don't do right, all the ways in which you fall short. So that those that cared, those that took it very seriously, it became this, this really big burden. Now those who didn't care, they would go, they would confess a few things. The priest would give them a penance to do. He would give them, okay, you need, to, you need to say these prayers. You need to give these alms. You need to do these things. You need to go to four masses. Right? He would give them things to make up for the things that they've, they've done. But the folks who really were introspective, the folks who really wanted to examine their own souls, like Martin Luther, who we're going to talk about next week, it became this huge burden that it really, really bothered them because they felt like they could never confess all of their sins. They felt like they couldn't ever get it all out. Um, so it brings in uh, this, this idea of penance comes in uh, in the mid-13th or the beginning of the 13th century. Uh, but then it brings up the idea. All right, so the tap of grace comes to us, comes to us first in baptism, then in confirmation, and then in this regular mass in which the grace of God receives, we're receiving the grace of God. And then we're, we're having confession and penance because we want to sort of check on ourselves and make sure that we're receiving enough grace, that we're meriting the, the salvation of God. And then those who took it serious realize, and even that's not enough, I I'm, I'm still, still have sin in me, I'm still not meriting the full grace of God. So then it begs the question, okay, well, what, do you, what happens if you die and you, you've not quite lived up, or you've not quite done enough, you've not quite merited the full grace of God, that you still have sin, you still have unconfessed sin, you still have things that haven't been dealt with in your life. So then comes in the idea of, of purgatory. So all the way back to the 3rd century, um, early church father by the name of Origen, and then another guy, uh, Clement of Alexandria, both sort of speculate about this. They, they ask the question, how can we be perfect in heaven if we're so sinful here? So they ask that question, and they, and they speculate. I don't know. They, they have some ideas of what that might look like. So as you, as you come uh, to the 11th, 12th, 13th century, the Catholic Church takes that and develops uh, a theology of, of purgatory. Where, what, what scripture do you think they used to justify the uh, theology of purgatory? Yeah, that's what they would put. Uh, they didn't really even try. Because <laughs> remember, what's the what's the Bible for Catholic theology? It's just the seed, right? Uh, so that, that would talk about fire purifying us, but there's nothing in Scripture that would point to this intermediate phase. So this is what purgatory is. It's not heaven. It's not hell. It's when you die, you go to this place in order to have your impurities, your sins burned away forever, however long is necessary, depending on what sort of life you lived, before you can enter into glory. So that if you're a member of the church, you will enter into glory, or you will go to heaven if you're a member of the church, but depending on the life you lived, you're going to have to spend a certain amount of time in purgatory. It's purely speculation. There's nothing in Scripture. They don't have to, they don't have, to have it from the Scripture because this, the Bible is the seed of theology. So you begin to, to understand that this tap of grace that is coming, people want this grace partly because they, they feel like they need it for their daily life, but they need it because they want to spend less time in purgatory. 
So that, at this time, wealthy men would build uh, chapels, and they would hire priests, and a priest would, would say a daily mass every single day for their benefactor. So that every day, man, I'm, I'm banking up this grace so that hopefully, hopefully I spend some less time uh, in purgatory. People who didn't have as much money would often pool together, uh, and then they would uh, pay to have a chapel built and pay a priest to say a daily mass for them. Uh, to, try to, to try to build up uh, their storehouse of grace so that they might spend less time in purgatory. Does that make sense? Do you see how these things build on each other? They're trying to answer questions about how it is that, essentially how it is that you get to heaven. So in this comes, uh, with, pur- with purgatory, with this idea of purgatory, comes indulgences. So who are the people that are most venerated in the Catholic Church? What do we call them? Saints. So the saints are those people that were so holy, they didn't have to go to purgatory. Such had the grace of God, they went straight to heaven. And what the Catholic Church says is, well, most of these saints, not only were they so holy, they didn't have to go to purgatory, they have essentially surplus grace. They have surplus surplus merit. They have extra that they didn't need because they were so holy, they were so righteous. Uh, So therefore, uh, that, that excess grace then is available to other people. And so the church says, we can dole that out, we can give that grace out. We can give that merit out to people uh, for lots of ways. Um, so one of the ways you got, you got that extra grace, if you went on a crusades, uh, you, were, you were conferred grace from the Catholic Church that would uh, lower your time in, in purgatory. Uh, indulgences comes in uh, where you could pay a fee. You could pay money. You pay money to the Catholic Church, and they would sell you an indulgence. They would sell you leftover grace from the saints that weren't used, essentially, right? So. What a weird concept, but they weren't using it. This would help you. You could buy it for yourself. Uh, what, if your, what if your mother, your father died, and they had been a part of the Catholic Church but had not been very faithful? Right? How long do you think they're going to be in purgatory? A long time. Well, if you're a good son, if you're a good daughter, aren't you going to work to get money to, to buy indulgences that you might lessen the time of your parents in purgatory? Aren't you going to pay to have masses said? That you might have, that you might lessen their time in purgatory, or that they, they begin to, to try to. The whole point is you want to lessen your time there, that you can go, uh, that you can go straight to heaven. Uh, the, one of the, the big guys that Luther fights with is a guy named Johann Tetzel, uh, who sells indulgences. And one of his phrases that he used was, "As soon as the coin in the coffer uh, rings, a soul from purgatory springs." <laughs> and so you you put the money in, and and you get uh, you get this time. Uh, uh, you get this time off your purgatory. Uh, so this becomes a money maker for the church, as well as uh, people paying to have chapels built, being p- people paying priests in order to say mass, mass for them. So money begins to pour into the church right at the time as we're coming out of the med- medieval age and coming into what would be a renaissance. And so the church now has this money that they can pour back into the arts. Um, well, this is a picture of a pope, by the way. I don't know which one. Yeah, yeah. It's just like this much time off, essentially. Um, so this is one of the popes. I think this is um, uh, one of the bourgeois, but I'm not. I meant to write his name down, but I forgot. It's a painting of him. So the church begins to have this money, and begin to pour that money back into the church. So uh, this is a, a cathedral. You can see there the uh, you can see there the altar. I'm gonna. This is the the uh, Sistine Chapel. Anybody remember who paints the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel? Michelangelo. That that was uh, uh, Saint Peter's. The the first one was Saint Peter's, by the way. Uh, this one right here, St. Peter's Church. Uh, this is the Sistine Chapel. They paid Michelangelo. There's a, another, another look at the Sistine Chapel. Um, so they have St. Peter's built. Um, they, they pay Michelangelo. They have all these great pieces of art. Um, we're going to not leave that up very long. Uh, we're going to have, they have all these pieces of work. Um, they began to, to pay a guy by the name of Erasmus, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, who does translation work. Um, writing begins to come back, which we'll talk about again in a little bit. So this money is now beginning to come into the Catholic Church uh, from this idea of purgatory, from indulgences, from the Mass, and then also then from the idea of saints and relics. So as Catholic theology develops here, Jesus becomes uh, seen as this very distant figure. We cannot go to Jesus. So if I cannot go to Jesus for help, maybe I could go to Jesus's mother for help, right? So official Roman Catholic doctrine says that the mother, that Mary is not to be worshipped, right? She's not, uh, she's to be honored, she's to be venerated, but she's not worshipped. So they began to say, well, we could pray to Mary, right, that she might come to us or come to Jesus on our, on our behalf. Now, even then what happens over time is that Mary becomes so venerated that we can't go to Mary, we're going to go to Mary's mother, which is 
Anne. You go to St. Anne. All right, and then from there, it begins to expand out that it's not just St. Anne. It's, we can go to any of these saints. So we would go to the, these saints, and then these saints then would go to us on behalf of Jesus. And then it develops this, uh, this whole culture of saints and relics uh, so that each area, different churches, and different places would want to have relics. So they would want to have a lock uh, of St. Patrick's hair. They would want to have, uh, there was a saying, uh, I think Luther said it, uh, that there are enough splinters of the cross going around to build uh, t- tin crosses, right? So there, everybody has these relics that supposedly, sometimes probably real, sometimes probably not, that belong to either Jesus or Mary or Anne or, or one of the saints. Or they have his tooth, or they have his tomb, or they, they have this piece, and so they would then display it, that you could come and you could receive their excess grace by coming and often just looking upon the relic. Now, are they going to let you come and look at the relic? What are you going to do? You pay. It becomes another way in which people receive the grace and which, uh, which brings, money, uh, brings money into the church. Now, I want to say, I, I am a committed Protestant, but I, I want to be clear here that often what I find within Roman Catholic theology and within the shifts, that often there are real, genuine people who are trying to trying to make good decisions. Right? They're, 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 they're not intentionally saying, we want to obscure the gospel. We want to make it hard for poor people to be saved. We, we want to, to not teach them the Bible. Right? There are some people within the Catholic Church that are, are not great theologians. There are some people in the Protestant Church that aren't great theologians. Right? That, I want to try to be charitable there and to say that many people are trying to think this, think this through in the best way that they knew how, given the information that they had, uh, given the system that they'd grown up in, given the Catholic Church that they grew up in, that they're trying to then to say, Okay, how can people get grace? Okay, this is a way that they could get grace. Okay, well, if that's not enough, how else might they be able to do it? They're, they're trying to think of ways that they can turn on the type of grace uh, for the people. So I know some of this, especially if you're not from a Catholic background, can sound weird. And I think, how could they ever get there? I want us to be charitable to them uh, and to understand if, if you grew up in the Catholic Church in the 13th century, this is what you would have known. Um, this is all you would have known. Uh, and so understanding... They're not, most of them are not ill, uh, have ill uh, will. They're, they're trying the best they can to make good decisions to help people uh, to, to know God. But as you see, as you can see, all these things leading up then to, uh, to the Reformation have obscured the gospel. They have obscured the, way, the ways in which we're actually saved, which is by grace, through faith alone, uh, through Christ alone. And that it's not through indulgences, it's not through purgatory, it's not through saints, uh, it's not through re- the receiving of the Mass, that it's the Scripture. So at, throughout this time, you see a, a, a not just that these things aren't always found in the Scripture, you see a, a move away from the Scriptures. Uh, so they, a guy by the name of Jerome translates the Bible in, uh, into Latin, into what, what's called the Latin Vulgate. It's the official, it was the official Bible of, of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. You were not allowed to read, uh, most, most lay people weren't allowed to read the Bible. Even if they could read Latin, they weren't allowed to have a copy of the Bible. Um, but if you remember, we said, who knows Latin? Very few people know Latin. Often even the priests don't know Latin. So who's actually reading the Bible? Very few people in the Catholic Church were reading the Bible because they couldn't. There was, the Bible was only in Latin, and they were not, and, and uh, only uh, priests and those in clergy were allowed to read it, and many of them didn't know Latin. So many of them weren't familiar with the Scriptures at all. They were familiar with the system of the church, but weren't familiar with their Scriptures whatsoever. And so you have this, this moving away from the Scriptures so that uh, if, if you were to sort of think about all these, these big pieces that we've talked about, the structure of the Catholic Church, when we talk, sort of talked about a campfire, these are sort of the logs that are all stacked up, and then God's going to put some brush underneath those logs that are going to catch fire for the Reformation. This all makes sense? All right, I'm not a Roman Catholic scholar. I, I hope that I've represented them. Now, I will say, this is important to note, that I'm speaking about Roman Catholic theology at the time of the Reformation. I'm not an expert on current Roman Catholic theology. I know they've had their own uh, reforms uh, even after our Reformation, they've, they've had their own reforms, they've had their own councils, they have their, their own changes. Um, there are pieces that are still going to be the same, but I'm sure there are pieces that would be represented very differently by current-day Catholics. Uh, I'm talking about medieval reformation era Catholicism, which is going to be a little, obviously it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, so they've, they've talked about things. Everybody make sense? All right, let's talk about precursors to the Reformation. Two, two big pieces, two big people, uh, and then one, one sort of movement. The first one is a, name, a guy named John Wycliffe. He's born 1320. He's born in Yorkshire. Um, eventually, he is, becomes a priest. He's ordained, and he goes, uh, and he's a priest in Oxford, England. Uh, at the time, at 1378, 
there were two popes of the church. There actually becomes a time uh, later in that century where uh, at one point we had, they had three popes all together. It was called the Great Schism. Uh, essentially, there's lots of fighting. Uh, the one pope's in Rome, one po- pope's in Avignon, France, one pope is in Spain. Uh, well, they had two, and then they came together in a council and said, we're going to get rid of you two, and this guy's going to be the pope, and we're just going to have one pope. And what do you think happened from that? Now we got three popes, right? The other two guys said, we're not stepping down. We're st-. All right, so now you got three popes. It was the great schism. Uh, so even within the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there was great fighting over uh, the papacy. There was great fighting over who was going to be in charge. Uh, that often, as we, we see through church history, that the pope had not just religious control, but often had uh, uh, governmental control over, over areas and territories. So it was a big deal to be the pope. Uh, and so people wanted to be the Pope. Some of them were pious men who sought to live righteous lives. Some of them were not. Some of them uh, were far from righteous. Uh, and so you, you have at that time some people seeing the lifestyles that even the, the Pope lived uh, that often was very, very unrighteous. The guy that I put earlier uh, is one of the, the bourgeois. I think there was, a, there was a, I think it was a Showtime or HBO uh, a series a few years ago. I remember seeing commercial, commercials for it that's about the bourgeois family. Um, and, and the way that the, those popes lived. Uh, so you have this guy, John Wycliffe. At the time he, he uh, is serving as a priest, there are two popes. Um, and Wycliffe begins to say, you know what, I don't think the pope is the final authority for the church. I think the Bible is the final authority for the church. Uh, he rejects transubstantiation. He says, I don't think that's in the Bible. I don't, I don't think that's what's happening at the Mass. Uh, he, he writes enough that eventually people get his attention, um, and he, he is forced to retire and essentially go into exile where he spends the rest of his life writing um, and eventually translating the scriptures uh, until he died. He translates the Latin Vulgate into English. So he wants people to be able to read the Bible in their own language. So he takes the Latin and he translates it into English. This is a huge deal. So if we talk about the Reformation as going back to the Bible, in order to do that, people have to have access to the Bible. And John Wycliffe is the first guy who begins to translate the Latin Vulgate into English so that regular people, if they were literate, could, le- could read. That regular people could read the Bible. Uh, he dies in 1384. Uh, not, not too long afterwards, at the Council of Constance, uh, they deem him a heretic. Now, keep in mind, he's already dead. Uh, they deem him a heretic. They dig up his bones and they burn them, uh, even though he's already dead. Uh, but he's, at this point, his uh, translation has already been made. Uh, he has people who follow him. They, call, they were called the Lollards. It's a, a French word that, that sounds like the mumblers. And they're, they're called that because they would take these English Bibles these, uh, and they would make copies of them. And then they would have secret Bible reading meetings where they would meet in homes or they would meet uh, late at night to read the Bible. And they were called Lollards, mumblers, because they would read very quietly because you can't get caught reading a Bible. It was illegal to possess a Bible in English. Uh, so he has followers. He makes this translation. So even after his death, he begins to, uh, uh, his influence begins to spread. Now he's at Oxford. And while he's teaching at, at, at Oxford, often uh, students from a, a university in, in Bohemia, which was, I believe is now like the Czech Republic, was at the time Bohemia. They would come to Oxford and they would have debates and they would do study, just like students travel now to other universities. And some of those students from Bohemia hear Wycliffe's teaching and began to read his writings and buy into it. And they take that with them from uh, Oxford and take it back to Bohemia, back to the Czech Republic, and influence a guy by the name of John Huss, who at the time was the rector of the University of of Prague, um, who's uh, the next guy in your thing. So John Huss, deeply influenced by Wycliffe, he defends him, he defends his positions. Uh, He was very outspoken against the church, takes many of the same positions that Wycliffe does. He denies uh, that indulgences are biblical. Uh, he denies purgatory. Uh, he denies transubstantiation. Um, so at the same council, the Council of Constance, in which at this point, remember Wycliffe's dead, they deem him a heretic, they dig up his bones and, and burn them. Uh, John Huss gets called there, and Huss says, well, no, I'm not coming. That's stupid. Why would I come to that? You're going to kill me. And they say, no, no, we'll give you safe passage um, to come and defend your views, to come. Uh, so he comes. Uh, they, they, uh, they lied to him. He was immediately arrested, was put in jail six months later, was put on trial, um, and then was executed, was deemed a heretic by the church, and was killed in 1415. Uh, so the, in his wake, there were folks who, who followed him called Hussites. Uh, the Catholic Church tried to stamp them out there in Bohemia, and ultimately they were unsuccessful. Um, so there is a line, I'm not, I'm not sure the, what, what, they're present, uh, what they're presently known as, but there are a line of churches in Bohemia uh, in the Czech Republic right now and in uh, Eastern Europe 
that are descendants from the Hussites, that they, they were actually allowed to exist eventually by the Catholic Church. Um, as he's dying, he, he reportedly says, um, right before his death, as they're about to, um, to, to uh, believe, I think, I believe he was burned at the pyre, uh, he says, you may roast this goose, Hus, uh, Hus means goose, you may, roast, you may roast this goose, but a hundred years from now, a swan will arise whose singing you will not be able to silence. Just a hundred years later, who comes on the scene? Luther. Uh, almost a hundred years uh, after the death of Huss, Luther comes on the scene. Uh, and so if you'll notice, like Luther on his pulpit, uh, what's, what was on the front of Luther's pulpit? A swan. It was often the, the symbol used for the Reformation and used for those who followed Luther. Uh, he saw himself, uh, I think rightly so, he saw himself rightly as this swan, this, this new thing that was coming. So Wycliffe and Huss aren't there to see the full-blown Reformation, but their work at the beginning has great influence on these guys that are going to come. Both Luther, Calvin, and Zimbabwe all talk about the influence that both Wycliffe and Huss have on them. And much of their influence is uh, not just their, uh, their bravery to say, hey, we don't think indulgences are right, or we don't think that's what the Bible says about the Mass, or and not to just to, de- to defy the Catholic Church, but to say, we actually think we should go back to the Bible. We want regular people to be able to read the Bible. We think the priest should be able to know the Bible. We, right, this return to the Bible in the language of the people, which is going to be the lifeblood of the Reformation. Right? Does that make sense? All right, last thing we want to talk about, the precursors to the Reformation, is this idea of humanism. A guy by the name of Petrarch uh, was an early humanist. Uh, he, he thought that he was ushering in, he and his followers were ushering in a new age. Remember, we're coming out of the Dark Ages. We're coming out of medieval times. Uh, that this new Renaissance is coming. This return to classical uh, civilization now is being reborn. So they saw themselves as those who are sort of remaking the world. And art is being revived. Writing is being revived. The return to the classic literature. Return to classic rhetoric. Return to classic art. That they're, they're, the humanists see themselves as this rebirth of the classics now for a new time. Uh, he. Uh, about the same time, uh, I don't, I don't have his, I don't have his birth dates with me. Uh, he's before Erasmus, so it would have been early 15th century, late 13th century ish, uh, is when humanism begins to take off. Um, so they're, they're big, uh, their big cry is ad fontes. Does anybody know what ad fontes means? I gotta learn some Latin. Just joking. To the fount, essentially meaning to the source. I say, where, wh- what, what, what should writing and art, what should all these things be about? We're going to go back to the sources. We're going to go back and read the classics. We're going to go back to the actual text. Now, why would this have any impact on the coming Reformation? Now, these guys weren't necessarily Christians. This is humanism is an entirely different movement that begins uh, pushing this idea of going back to the sources. What influence would this have on the Reformation? Go back to the Bible, right? Ad fontes. Go, go back to the source. Rather than receiving truth from other people or from the structure of the church, where do you get truth from? You go back to the source. You go back to the scriptures. Um, they weren't particularly seen very well uh, by the church, uh, particularly because of this, because they went back to the source, uh, just sort of a, a funny way that they get themselves in trouble. Uh, there's a fourth century letter that the church had called the Donation of Constantine, in which Constantine is essentially writing the church um, and saying that he's donating Constantinople to them. Uh, the church used that letter to say then that they have authority over Eastern, uh, over Europe, right? Um, and so there's a guy, a humanist named Lorenzo Valla, who takes that document, takes this donation of Constantinople that the church has used at this point for about a thousand years to uh, um, say that they have authority over Europe because this letter from Constantine gives them that authority. Uh, he takes that, he examines it, he looks at other writings of Constantine's, he goes back to the source, and he's able to determine not only is this a fake, it's a very bad fake. This is not a true letter. That this is Constantine did not write this letter. Um, you can imagine that the Catholic Church was not very happy about that. All right? It's one of the ways they get themselves in trouble. That same guy, uh, Lorenzo Valla, uh, writes a book called The Annotations on the New Testament. And what he does is he takes the Greek New Testament. Remember, he's going back to the source. He takes the Greek New Testament, and he takes the Latin Vulgate, and he goes through, and he he begins to annotate all the places that he thinks the Latin Vulgate is wrong in translation, that he thinks that the Latin Vulgate doesn't actually represent very accurately what was said in the Greek New Testament, going back to the found. 
right, lays the groundwork for uh, these other ref reformers that are going to come and say, we think that there are errors in the translation of the Vulgate. We actually want to translate the Bible into the vernacular of the people. We want to translate the Bible in a way that the people can understand. So out of this comes a humanist by the name of Erasmus. Now, he's a complicated figure. Um, if there were ever a man who set the fence, it was Erasmus, right? So there are, are times that he, uh, that he leans towards the reformers, and then there are times that he leans towards the church. Uh, he actually ends his life you know, leaning towards the church way. Uh, Luther said of him, uh, he, will, he will burnish his no until it becomes a yes if he needs to, and he'll burnish his yes until it becomes a no if he needs to. That he, he was a very careful guy, and that he didn't essentially want to be put out from either side, from the reformers or from the church. Uh, he was, considered himself a humanist. He was a humanist scholar. And in 1516, he publishes a Greek New Testament, um, and he, he has the Greek New Testament on one side, and he puts his own Latin translation on the other side. Now, notice he does this not because he wants to hurt the church. He actually dedicates it to the Pope. At this point, he thinks he's working for the church. So he has his, his Greek New Testament with his own Latin translation on the right side, which differs often very, very importantly from the Latin Vulgate. So one of the, the important places that it differs is in Matthew 4.17. Somebody pull out a Bible and go to Matthew 4.17. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does anybody know what the Latin Vulgate, the way they translate repent? Do penance. Why would they translate that do penance? It fits their structure, right? So that someone, if they, even if, they, if a priest were able to read the scriptures, if he were to read the Vulgate, he would read that Jesus says do penance. So of course you should do penance. Of course you should come to confession. And Jesus said it, do penance. Now, the word from the Greek New Testament, does not mean do penance. So Erasmus, not meaning to hurt the church, translates it not do penance, but rather be penitent, be repentant, repent. Which So as people then can begin to read the Bible and read that it does not say do penance, but rather repent, be penitent, that this is going to begin to lay the foundation for these reformers who are going to be influenced by Erasmus to say, okay, so the repentance now isn't confession to a priest, repentance isn't uh, jumping through hoops or saying prayers or going to a mass. That that's not repentance. That's not what repentance is. That's not what the Bible defines repentance is. That repentance is this turning away from sin and turning to Jesus. It is this hating of sin and loving of, of Christ. That, that it's changing in the way that they understand repentance. Do you see why Erasmus was, uh, was so important? His, his Greek New Testament uh, and his, his Latin translation are, are both going to be uh, really important. But it's during this time that the humanist. Uh, because of their writing, because of the way they sort of poked at the Catholic Church, people began to ask the question, maybe the Pope isn't right. Maybe the scholars of the church are wrong. Maybe there are things that they've gotten wrong. Maybe there are even things in the Vulgate that are wrong. Maybe, maybe they've translated very poorly. Maybe, maybe that's not actually what the Greek New Testament says, that they're, they're being pushed to ask questions to go back to the source. This is laying then a foundation. So if we're talking about the, the structure of the Catholic Church, it's all of the logs, uh, Wycliffe, Huss, the humanists are sort of the kindling that are in between the logs that are ready to take a spark, which Luther is going to be, which this, this spark is going to happen, which is all going to go up in flames. Uh, last big thing that, that really begins to, to uh, help this all to take off happens in 1450, a guy by the name of Johann Gutenberg. What's he make? The printing press. So for the first time now, you don't have to have handwritten copies, which were normally done in monasteries. Now you, begin, you can begin to print and begin to print multiple copies much quicker. Now they're still expensive, but the writings of people like Wycliffe and Huss and Erasmus and later the writings of Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, not only can they be disseminated, they can be disseminated much quicker and much cheaper than they used to be. So that now the writings, the arguments these men are making aren't nearly as locally focused, but they can go to all sorts of places. The printing press opens up knowledge for people. It opens up this, this return to the font for people from all over because you don't have to know Luther. You don't have to live in a city now to hear what he's saying. It's much easier to get your hands on Luther's track or to get your hands on Erasmus Greek New Testament, right? to get your hands on the writings of Wycliffe or Huss, right? to, to get your hands on the illegal English Bible. Right there, the, the, the Gutenberg printing press opens up this wealth of knowledge for people as they're, at the same time as they're asking these questions. What is truth? Can we go back? To, how do we go back to the source? How do we go back to the Bible? That's what these reformers are wrestling with. That's what Luther is, is wrestling with. Um, so they come with, I didn't put this in your book. We're going to talk about it more. Uh, we're going to talk about it more next week. That the, the rallying cry of the Reformation uh, for Luther and those that follow him 
uh, coming out of all of this Catholic theology, they're wrestling with how, how can we be saved? How is it that we know God? How do we return to the source? Uh, and they, they, the rallying cry is these five solas. Anybody know what they are? Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gratias, Sola Christus, and Sola Deo Gloria. Meaning that the rallying cry of the Reformation is what is the church built on? It is built on Scripture alone. What's the final authority of the church? It is not the church, it's the scriptures, not the popes, not a structure, it's not a council. All those things are uh, underneath the authority of scripture. What is the, the main way that we're saved? It is saved by faith alone, right? Not faith and works combined, which, is the, which was at the time. I'm not sure how, the, I'm not sure how present-day Roman Catholic theology would, de- would, would define that, but medieval Catholic theology says it's faith and works. It's faith in Jesus and these other things, this implicit faith that you have to have by going through the systems and the structures of the Catholic church. Well, the reformers say, no, it's, we're saved by faith alone, by grace alone. It's all of grace. It's none of our works. We don't merit anything that we've gotten. It's by grace alone, by faith alone, by who alone? By Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so it becomes this rallying cry. Uh, now, some have argued, when they talk about Reformation faith, that Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and all these reformers make this up, that this is a theology that they, that they develop. What I hope that you'll see as we walk through their theology, as they walk, walk through what they argue, that this is not something that they developed. It's not something that they sat down and said, what would be a good rejoinder to the Catholic Church? What would really make them mad? Let's come up with a better theology. I don't think that's at all what they did. I think they went back, oh, I erased it. I think they went back to the source, and I think they recovered rather than defined faith. Does that make sense? They're recovering what the church had believed. They're recovering what had been taught, even in places within uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they're recovering the, goth, the true gospel rather than, uh, rather than discovering it for the first time or, or writing it for the first time. That They're returning back to this uh, theology that had been around uh, for centuries. It's a theology of the Bible, it's a theology of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I do want to say, I, I know earlier I talked about the difference between uh, medieval theology and Roman Catholic, present-day Roman Catholic theology. I believe that there are uh, good, godly people that were within the, within the Roman Catholic Church then and that are within the Roman Catholic Church now uh, that I think that you can be within in the Roman Catholic Church and I think you can be saved. I think you can truly believe the gospel and be saved. I would argue, because I'm a Protestant, if you're within the Roman Catholic Church and you are saved, you are a Christian, but you're probably a bad Roman Catholic. You, you don't hold strictly to the full teaching of the church. I know Roman Catholics who, want to, when we talk about the gospel, they, they believe what I believe. That often they don't know what the official teachings of the Catholic Church are. Official teaching of the Catholic Church is I am anathema because I'm not a part of the Roman Catholic Church. That they would say that I don't belong to the Bride of Christ because I don't belong to the church, which would be the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They often... Most Catholics that I know, it's not true of all, all Catholics, many Catholics that I know don't know much about Catholic theology. That, that They've learned theology from other places, and that they would say, yeah, I believe the same thing you do. So when I say that, I, 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 don't, I don't want to at all in this Reformation class to paint this as us Protestants are all saved. Are there people in Protestant churches that aren't saved? Sure, right, lots of them. Are there people in Catholic churches that are saved? Sure, lots of them, right? Uh, I, I think it makes you probably a bad Catholic, but I, I, I can live with that, right? So I, I want us to be gracious and to understand that, that, but for the grace of God, we too wouldn't know the gospel. So I want us to be thankful for the reformers. I want us to be thankful for this recovery of the gospel without becoming rude or combative towards those that see things differently than us, even where we say and rightly say, that's wrong. It's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the gospel is, right? We have to do that. There's a way to do that with grace and kindness rather than uh, in a mean and, and rude way. Does that make sense? So I, I hope that I'm representing both medieval Catholic theology well, and I hope that I'm representing as best I can present-day Catholic theology well. Uh, anytime you re- try to represent somebody else's view, you should try to do it to the degree that they would hear what you said and say, yeah, no, that, that's what I believe. We want to deal with the arguments that are actually there. Um, is this, any questions? We've got a few minutes for questions. Do you see how all of this is building to this need of reformation and what's going to come with Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and, and the lot? Any questions about anything we've talked about today? So infallibility doesn't come in until, until later. Essentially, people aren't really arguing about that right now. Um, so I think 
we were at a, at a panel um, at the SBC, and I think it was Moeller or somebody talked about the principle, uh, is that heresy clarifies doctrine. So that if nobody's fighting about infer- infallibility, nobody's fighting about inerrancy, because we're all they were all pretty much on the same page that the, the Bible is true, even though they had arguments about how to translate it. There, nobody was arguing that the Bible was was not inerrant. No one's fighting over that. So you don't you you are left with less clarity about what you mean when you say inerrant. It's when people begin to come in and say, no, no okay, uh, I believe the Bible is inerrant, but I don't think Job really happened or they began to question, then that's what causes the church to come and say, oh, okay, we're going to clarify what we mean. Uh, so this happened early on in the church, in church history with, uh, with the deity of Christ. So those that would look and say, oh, the Council of Nicaea is making up the deity of Christ, right? That they're, they're creating the theology of the Nicaea about the deity of Jesus that wasn't there before. That's not it at all. The reason you have the Council of Nicaea is because there are heretics who are saying Jesus isn't God. And so the church says, no, no, we, in order to combat heresy and to be clear about what we believe, we need to gather together to put down on paper very clearly in confessional statements what we think the Bible teaches about Jesus. And so the same thing is true with inerrancy. It doesn't, it's a fight that doesn't come up for a while because uh, there aren't many people pushing it. So they don't have many, many, very many doctrinal statements that clearly define what that, what that means. Heresy always pushes us. Uh, the same reason even like for us as Baptists, our Baptist faith and message will look different in a hundred years than it does right now, because there will be issues in a hundred years that we're not thinking about right now. A uh, hundred years ago, our Baptist faith and message didn't need to say anything about gender. And then transgender was not a thing. Nobody thought about it. But as those things, as people began to, to push, then that's what causes you to come back and say, oh, okay, we're going to clarify this is, this is what we mean. Uh, and so inerrancy is not a, something that's going to come up for a while. I don't have a good answer for the number, but it's a good ways down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll hit on we'll hit on that. Um, I wish I knew more about current present day Roman Catholic theology. Uh, they have to, for their own credit, have, they have tried reforms. They did things coming out of the Reformation that, that made it better. Uh, tried to get rid of some of the excess and some of the the licentiousness and unrighteous lifestyles of popes and things like that. But yeah, you're right. The big point is uh, those that would say Protestants and Catholics are together. I would say even the Catholic Church says that's not true. Catholic Church says that we are anathema, that if, if, we don't, if we hold to grace alone through faith alone, that we don't belong to Jesus. All right, I have time left. I don't know what this feels like. <laughs> well, let me pray for us, and you can get out early. Father God, we love you, and we, uh, we thank you for the grace that you've shown us. Uh, we don't deserve it, and we didn't do anything to earn it, but that you have freely saved us in Christ. Uh, We confess even now that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. Uh, Father, we pray that that would be for your glory. Uh, Father, as we come to to this service now, as we uh, go to sit under your word, we pray that you would help us to do that, that you would help us to subject our thoughts and opinions, our traditions, that everything that we think would be subject to the word of God, that it would be the final authority in our life. We pray that you would be with our our pastor. Uh, He is faithful to study uh, and to, to try to speak to us from your word. We pray that you would give him the words to say, that we would hear your word. And we pray for eyes to see and ears to hear, that your spirit would take the word and help to apply it to our hearts and our lives, that we may know you and follow you and love you more uh, closely. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.